So joining us now, we have Raul Neva. Uh, he's talking about embedded finance and the new API infrastructure. Um, Raul, do you want to welcome yourself to the stage? Yeah. Hi, hi, Ben. Hey, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. It's a pleasure to be Good here to share with the, with the audience this interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, this sounds super interested, embedded finance and the new API infrastructure. It's a two kind of... You know, converging technologies in different industries, but it, you know there's there's so much overlap. So, over to you. I'm super excited to hear about this, and uh, thanks again for joining us at API Days London. Thank you. And so, uh, well, we will start with the with the presentation. So, um, the idea is to talk about uh, the embedded finance and how new API infrastructure is, is being built. I mean, we have just uh, heard in the into your previous uh, conference with uh, Simon and, and Robert. Uh, how this uh, blockchain, for example, infrastructure is transforming the way APIs are being, are being shared. But uh, first, I want to start like providing a, a perspective, a general perspective of how this uh, uh, information technology has worked for, for banking, like in the previous uh, years, maybe 10 to 10 to 20 years. So uh, in the beginning, we have this integrated banking uh, where usually banks manage all the value chain infrastructure and services. This means that, for example, the distribution, the processing, and the manufacturing and the manufacturing of financial services was done by banks uh, in the whole value chain. So, uh, in this phase, technology is was more a commodity than a differentiator. This this was something that the entity, the financial entity, had to have in order to be competitive and in order to, to work and, and, and function. You know? uh, we usually saw these uh, big uh, computer sites where there were a lot of servers being managed by a large IT staff from, from the bank. You know? So uh, as we progressed into the uh, beginnings of this new uh, century, uh, we started to see some disaggregated banking, meaning that there were some uh, technology-based financial service providers emerging and um, they start like providing some simple use cases, for example, price comparators of uh, some kind of uh, account logging through the use of screen scrapping. However, uh, there were some other players like providing, for example, payment processing services no? or uh, infrastructure services. We started to see the emergence of, of the cloud. No? And as we progress, we start to see this basic open banking. And in this third stage, we, we, what we saw is that um, there were some initiatives started mainly by, by regulators. In this case, I, I want to remark that, that, that the UK was the first country to issue some guidelines regarding uh, the sharing of information, of standardized information through APIs. So um, this uh, started more as an obligation that is, uh, than as a business model you know, by, by the financial industry, obliged by the regulators. So uh, we start to see like the, the exposure of APIs by banks. And also along with this, there were, no, there were new business models that were initiated mainly by global banks regarding premium APIs. So uh, when we talk about this phase, we, we, we uh, might refer to 2015, 2016. And from that year till now, we have seen some interesting and uh, some very uh, beneficial advances now because we now uh, we are now here to uh, see these uh, first or these products emerging from the open banking uh, model, and uh, there are there are some differences in countries because some some are more advanced and, than ours. But uh, generally speaking, uh, we are starting to see like um, the development and the, the implementation of these API models in, in the world war. No, so uh, what come, what comes next is open data. And this means that there will uh, we will have new financial services uh, and provided through an ecosystem, but also inter integrating other players, for example, retailers, for example, telcos, for example, energy companies. And also we will see uh, the uh, use of open finance plus the Web 3.0. So uh, this uh, picture of the world uh, usually uh, describes uh, the degree of advance that we have seen in the world uh, regarding the implementation of open finance. However, what I want to show here is that uh, there are some relevant uh, elements that are taken into consideration 
to uh, implement an open banking or open finance strategy. So uh, we have this regulatory approach, we have the financial inclusion, many, for example, uh, in countries where there is a lot of underbanked people, no, in, in LATAM or in Asia, uh, also the integration of new technologies that uh, I have talked briefly about in the previous slide, but also the degree of adoption that the user or that the final user has towards this kind of new uh, digital financial services, no? So uh, taking into account this regulatory approach, uh, what I want to show you here is uh, this schema that is adapted from a study made by CGAP, which is a business unit from the World Bank, which describes what would be like the ideal uh, regulatory model no, to, to implement open, open banking or open finance. And what uh, CGAP does is to divide the regulatory uh, variables into two uh, dimensions. One, the implementation components, and the other being the design components. So we have uh, into, what we, what we can do is like playing with these uh, elements and in the end define uh, a business uh, or an open, an open banking model, like uh, defining who will the participants be, what can or what types of services will be provided, if uh, these will be only limited to banks or uh, if there are other kind of financial companies that will be allowed to share APIs, for example, insurers or stockbrokers, no? what is the type of data that, that will be shared? Uh, what are like, the phases of implementation for the, implement for the implementation of open banking or open finance? If there are fees that can be uh, like, um, uh, that the third parties will, will pay no? to the data providers, uh, which will be like the responsibles to lead all this development. You know? So this is very important because in the end, it defines a framework and this framework will have to be shared between all the players into the into the ecosystem of a particular country. You know? So uh, as, a, as a use case, uh, this is an example of what is happening with this regulatory approach. You know? What we see here is like the payment initiation figure uh, like uh, which is like the traditional one from from the UK or from Europe, where there is this payment initiation service provider that the final user um, uses to sign in into their account or into his or her account, and then there are some uh, activities done in the background, like to authenticate the user, but also to start this uh, confirmation of payment. And in the end, what we see here is that this payment initiation services provider does some of the activities that the banks or the financial entities usually uh, do no, in order to make this payment feasible. No? So uh, if we take into account that the regulation is different in, in across the regions, uh, we, we can see this difference. And this is something that is happening or that is bound to happen in Latin America. No? So uh, the idea of payment, of payment initiation in this region is that we uh, have the figure of a central validator and the central validator is usually the central bank. So uh, with these kind of interactions, what we see is that um, the user can, down, can download any application from a third party. And when the user downloads this application, what it happens is that uh, there are some certificates uh, installed into the mobile phone, but these certificates, uh, what they do is like uh, to communicate or to transfer data between the mobile phone and the the, the parties or the, the uh, people that is participating into the whole transaction. But in the end, the third party becomes only a uh, an intermediation or an uh, does an intermediation figure of uh, communicating the payment, but actually does not many kind does does not conduct any kind of activity regarding the confirmation of funds or like the debit from the user's account. So uh, this is very interesting because uh, the model is very likely to be adopted in the Latin region. So uh, in the end, we will have like two approaches. But what I wanted to show you here is how this regulatory approach uh, plays uh, when we talk about this API infrastructure or embedded finance or new services. You know? So going on, going on into the uh, other element or variable that I was talking about, we have this financial inclusion. inclusion. So 
In this case, uh, this is very important because, for example, in, in LATAM, as I was uh, saying, uh, there is there are around uh, 30 to 40 percent of people that have bank accounts. So the region uh, presents a huge opportunity, for example, for financial services provider, being banks or being third parties, no? fintechs, for example, to provide these kind of financial services. They are called digital financial services to the users that have never had a, a, a bank account or a financial account. So, so uh, this is only an example of what is happening, for example, in Mexico and, and also in your countries in the region, like, uh, for example, this BBUBA, which is a big bank in the region, making an alliance with Uber so that, for example, the drivers can uh, be paid into bank accounts. So actually the driver that downloads the, the driver application from Uber, uh, one of the steps they have to complete is like opening an account, a bank account, so that they can uh, get paid. If they don't open the account, they won't be paid, no? So actually in this uh, financial inclusion schema, what we are starting to see is that uh, there are communities that are being formed where banks are working with many other industries in consortia. Um, there is, for example, another use case where uh, food corporations you know, are like enable, enabling um, convenience stores so that they can uh, use their food corporation network, information network, like to process payments. No? So this is also very interesting because it's helping to the financial inclusion. And um, we, we have now arrived to this embedded finance, which is like the main title of my, my conference. So uh, when we have embedded finance, we also speak about the integration of new technologies. No? So in this diagram, in this diagram, what we are seeing is that uh, the user uh, usually uh, downloads applications from Google, from Amazon, from social networks to chat, to interact, to share content, to post photos. So uh, in the end, this, this user is uh, working or interacting in, a, in an ecosystem with other people. So uh, part of these interactions have to do with financial services, for example, paying for something that a user finds valuable to, to buy or valuable to, to use or to acquire. And uh, we can like map all these uh, user needs. Uh, we are just talking, for example, as uh, we're talking only of a use case, which is, for example, lending. No? And if we take into account what uh, the workflow of this uh, lending or death origination uh, has, the, the steps that the workflow has, what we can see is that there are some steps that are very traditional because in the end, we are not like inventing something new. We're just like uh, transforming the usual or traditional process into a more uh, automated one and also into a more, into a more efficient one. So uh, when we see these steps, we can uh, arrive to this uh, step where there is death life, where, where, where it says death life cycle administration. And in this step, what we can see is that there is uh, an automatization of an amortization schedule so that the client can't uh, be reminded about when he or she needs to pay. But uh, when, we're, when we arrive to these payments, what we usually see is that uh, there is a lot of payment processing uh, services. However, uh, we have some services that are now being integrated into blockchain uh, by using these uh, decentralized networks. But also we have these payment networks that have a more traditional approach. Usually these are the, the rails that the network that the card issuers have built uh, among the years. We have other payment rails that are being built that like the one we saw about the payment initiation. But these are like usual usual networks that uh, employ uh, technology that has to do with Wealth 2.0. So the question here is how to integrate this kind of uh, workflow so that we can have uh, 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 an automated workflow that works for everyone and that has interaction with blockchain and also with APIs. So the answer is Web 3.0. And in this Web 3.0, what, what we have or the main explanation is that uh, the Web 3.0 looks to have this interconnection between blockchain services or blockchain networks and traditional networks. Uh, so this is uh, a problem that is being theory uh, now as we speak, 
However, there are some uh, good advances that I, I can share you about. And this has to do with uh, this kind of integration that some technology providers are are being built now. So in the end, what we have is like the best of, of both worlds. On one hand, we have like this uh, blockchain decentralized network. And on the other hand, we have like the off-chain networks or the traditional uh, networks, payment rails or uh, centralized databases. So in the end, there is no problem. What we can have is to interconnect, to have an interconnection between them. And in the end, uh, to have a final product that is beneficial for, for the users, no? And um, going now into the uh, end of my of my conference, um, I, I want to, to share you about this particular use case, no, of embedded finance and uh, integrated technologies. And this is about uh, an alliance that uh, has, uh, has to do with Open Bank project and also API tree. And basically what we are doing is to like uh, enable and engage these uh, off-chain networks with on-chain networks uh, through the use of a uh, connector, which is um, this product that we see that we see here, the the Ernot connector. And in the end, what we will have is like this kind of schema, no? Where uh, in the bottom we have these core banking systems or like the legacy technology that in the end we won't uh, uh, intend to modify because it's usually very expensive to do it. But uh, this core banking usually provides the, uh, several services, no? Like have to do with, for example, lending, onboarding, um, user profiles, uh, AML activities, etc. And if we connect these uh, several services that have or that are deployed with the core banking data and with the core banking processes, what we have is an API layer, uh, which uh, this is uh, now where the banks are or the financial entities are, they are starting to uh, appify their services. No? And uh, if we now add this extra layer of uh, API interconnectivity with a connector no, like Ernot, what we will what we'll have is that in the end, the user will, uh, will be able to download an application. And in this application, he or she will be able to transact and to interact uh, for example, in this uh, lending service that we were talking about in a very transparent manner. And in the end, it won't matter, for example, if the information from this lending product is stored into a blockchain network or if uh, the user has to pay like uh, their, their monthly uh, fee no, to, to, their, to their loan. Uh, in the end, uh, for the user, this will be very transparent and all will be integrated. So... Um, this is what I wanted to, to talk to you about, about like how APIs are now uh, being taken into the into the next step by transforming or by integrating with other emerging technologies like, like blockchain. So now <clears throat> back to you, uh, Eric. Hello, Raul, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for getting that together firstly. Um, there's... Uh, just going to check if there's any questions waiting. There's nothing up. So yeah, I mean, look, this this whole kind of concept of a, a you know a, a, an API layer that is firstly making use of open bank data, but is also capable of being embedded in what is um, traditional finance, and also I guess the the kind of decentralized applications that is quickly being built on top of protocols in Web 3.0. So so. You know, the, I, I, something else that you referenced with BBVA and Uber. Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts or perceptions on how that can enable perhaps a more financially inclusive ecosystem for whoever whoever may want to consume it, of course. Uh, sure, Ben. Well, um, it, it actually helps to the financial inclusion because, for example, uh, in the traditional model, for, there were a lot of drivers that were paid in cash. And yeah. uh, when these drivers are now interested into these mobility platforms, uh, they, they enter into some digital processes and part of these digital processes uh, mean that they have to uh, open a bank account. But uh, usually this driver won't like step in into a, into a branch, into a bank branch. So uh, what these kind of applications are doing is uh, are, are to provide these uh, drivers or other workers, mobility workers, 
with uh, some kind of uh, bank account embedded into their application. So uh, we have seen, at least in the region, in, in the Latin region, that this has helped to uh, increase the financial inclusion. And also yes. uh, for other kind of services, for example, loans or other kinds of financial services, um, the users have to onboard into some kind of uh, customer profile. And in the end, they are integrated into the formal financial system. Mm. So yeah, the, the off-chain data layer and how that is introduced into what is an on-chain financial services industry. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is off-chain credit scoring. You know, uh, how, how do you see how do you see that potentially playing out? Um, maybe if you look at LATAM and the the kind of you know they have very open APIs, they're very welcoming of of, of on-chain services. How would you see that playing out? The blend of real world data into the the kind of on chain, you know, off chain real world data into on chain products. Well, that's a that's a very interesting interesting question then because uh, we are starting to see these kind of use cases. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, for example, uh, when a company wanted to get a loan, uh, specifically small companies, uh, they presented their uh, request to a to a bank, and the process usually took about two to three weeks. So uh, we are now starting to see these kind of offerings by banks and fintechs where this uh, credit product is offered within minutes no, in the same uh, yeah. interface of a laptop or a mobile phone. And uh, what we are also starting to see is that there is an integration between platforms, meaning that, for example, uh, this screen scoring can uh, be performed using a traditional platform, maybe an off-chain an off platform, but also... Yeah. Um, uh, there are some products that are being deployed uh, mm -hmm. and that are more efficient and cost effective. So uh, we are seeing this kind of integrations between uh, the workflow of the wall uh, credit product so that some parts of the process are handled by off-chain and some other parts of the process are mm -hmm. handled by on-chain. No? Super interesting, super, super interesting. And then if, if you think about the API architecture and the design of the APIs and that interaction, what do you think is needed to, to kind of scale that operation to the, to the potential that it has? Mm, well, well, I think um, this has to do with technology, but also this has to do with regulation. So uh, mm. there are some parts of, of the wall uh, value chain that can be automated this way. We, we were talking about yeah. this great product, but there might be some other uh, kind of, there might be some other parts of the value chain that might not be that automated because of regulation. So I think that in the end, this will have to do with a case by case analysis, you know, so that we can know uh, how we can cope with the regulation, but also how, but also how uh, we can use the technology for a more efficient and convenient use. You know? Interesting, very interesting. Um, we've still got a few more minutes left. Let me just recheck if there is, Okay, interesting. So yeah, so the, I guess the regulatory side of things, like it's such a tricky uh, topic to navigate when you're looking at multiple countries, um, but yet the communities in those countries are still wanting to adopt it at the same pace. So, you know, you've got borders in geographical areas where people's behaviours might be adopting at the same rate, but then, you know, the cross-border regulation is is tricky to manage, right? So um, are, are you are you involved with you know are, are you kind of having conversations around how to approach that and how you can you can start to remove these barriers which are, are nothing more than kind of you know different nations having their own perception on on the same topic? Um, yeah, well, we I have the I have had the privilege of uh, talking with the regulator here in Mexico, but also with some other regulators in Latam, and uh, there is a, a continuous dialogue going on between authorities and also financial entities. So uh, in the end, I think that uh, the regulator has the final word, but uh, there, are, there is chance that uh, the voice of the financial entities is being heard. So, so I think that uh, we have now a regulatory framework in, in Mexico and Brazil, in Colombia is, is, is starting to be deployed and also in mm -hmm. Chile. But uh, I think that in the end, the regulator is also interested that uh, they, they are not that strict so that the model of open banking or open finance cannot be deployed. So they are yeah. open to, to hear ideas and suggestions from the from the financial entities. 
Interesting, interesting. Well, Raul, thanks again so much for joining us today. Um, it's massively appreciated. That was a very interesting topic. And I'm excited personally to see how this starts to play out over the next two, three, five years, perhaps, um, or beyond. But um, again, thank you so much. Um,